Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Lynn Jones. We're going to be speaking about contact lens technology, new innovations, and 3D printing of contact lenses on the OI Show. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insight Show. Today, we're joined by uh, Dr. Lynn Jones. It is a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks for the invitation, Dave. Glad to be here. Yeah. I, I think everybody knows who you are, but why don't you tell us a little bit about what's been happening uh, um, occupationally for you in the last uh, couple of years and what you're doing now? Sure. Yeah. So, so my, main, my main job these days is director of CORE. CORE is the Center for Ocular Research and Education. It's based at the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of Waterloo. And, and CORE's mission really is to work primarily in, in kind of four different research areas with, uh, with sponsors and using grant funding. So we, we continue to work in the contact lens space. Uh, many of the contact lenses that come on the market are, are things that have gone through our, our testing profiles at some point mm -hmm. or other. So contact lenses, dry eye, um, myopia management, and ocular drug delivery are the kind of four core things, the four core areas that we're working. Um, CORE has a group of just over 50 people, so we're the largest university-based research group doing work in that space. And we kind of divide up into basically our, our, our clinical trials platform, where we do human clinical trials at a variety of different stages of development. Basic sciences, so the, the sort of early stage development of dry eye and contact lens and ocular drug delivery, and uh, then our educational platform that kind of takes the information from those two platforms and pushes it out to clinicians to try and explain why it's relevant and important for them to know about. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that I really love about the research that CORE puts out is um, in, in most cases, some of your scientists are way more brilliant than I am and their writing is way more brilliant than I can read. But in most cases, when I read a paper, there's something that I can either apply or see that will apply to what I'm going to be dealing with in the future, or a product that you uh, have come out with will share with me how I can go about bringing it into clinic and how I can use it. So that's something I've always appreciated about the, the, the research that you do and then the writing that comes out of CORE. Well, thanks, Dave. That's, that's yeah. great to know, because honestly, that's our mission. Our mission is to, to try and take the highbrow science and, and really try and to make it practical to the clinician. I think a lot of that comes really from the fact that, that many of the people who've been in leadership roles at initially CCLR, so the Center for Contact Lens Research mm -hmm. that was rebranded in uh, a few years ago to core, are primary clinicians. I mean, that's, that's where I come from. I, I was in private yep. practice for 12 years in London with my wife. Uh, we had two, two basic practices that did a lot of pediatrics, a lot of contact lenses. But for me, it's, it's trying to take that highbrow science and say, and, and really try to make it clinical such that the clinician can go Okay, I get that. That's that's one that's important to me. So if that comes across when we uh, when we do our publications, then that's great to know. Yeah, yeah. Well, I certainly think it, it does. So, you know, getting to talk with somebody who is living in the future, you you literally are dealing with things right now that I have no idea are going to be available and products that are coming to the market um, today that you saw years ago. Talk to me about the future of contact lenses and some things that, um, you know, maybe we'll see in the next year or 10 years from now that are kind of cool. Well, it's really, and, and, and thanks for that opportunity, Dave, because it's really interesting to think about some of the kind of futuristic things that we actually have in the market now. I think there are a couple of things that, you know, maybe don't appreciate um, that were, you know, 10 years ago, science fiction. Oh, you're never going to be able to do that. You know, yeah. one of the things being something like a, like the transitions contact lens. So that the, the j and transitions lens, a photochromic contact lens, it's been something that, that people have dreamed about for, uh, for many, many years. And of course, now we've had that in the market for a number of years. Drug delivering contact lenses is another mm -hmm. thing. You know, I, I've been working in the area of drug delivering contact lenses since about 2002. And it, it seems like such a great idea. You know, whenever we treat ocular disease, we put drops in. Drops are great because they're nice and easy to, to pop in. The downside is they don't stay around for very long. You know, they no. only stay on the ocular surface for, you know, maybe 20 minutes at most before they drain away. So in order to get a therapeutically relevant concentration of a drug onto the ocular surface, you've got to really do two things. First of all, you've got to give a concentration that's really too high because you need that concentrated amount on the ocular surface. That results, of course, in both 
expense increase because you've got more drug in the, in the product than you really need. But the mo more important thing is potential toxicity issues. A lot of ocular drugs that we see, we, we end up seeing some uh, potential uh, ocular toxicity because the drug concentration is just too high solely because it drains from the ocular surface for so long. So right. for many, many years, we, we, we've really tried to have that increased residence time on the ocular surface and people have done it using a variety of different ways. You know, there's a way of binding it to the ocular surface using things like maybe mucus binding agents. Or typically, we just tend to bump up the viscosity. You do yeah. that, vision goes down. So patients don't like using. Yeah. So the concept around actually using a, a drug depot as a contact lens was actually, believe it or not, in the original Victorly patent. In 1961, Otto Victorly, when he, when he patented HEMA, had in there one of the potential advantages of a contact lens, a soft contact lens, is as a drug delivery device. Can you believe that? 1961. Wow. Good old Otto Victorly saying, hey, this would be a really good way of getting drugs onto the ocular surface. I didn't know that. It's taken us all the way until this year with j, j bringing out their, their ocular drug delivering ketotifin lens, um, so TheraVision, for us to be able to have a commercially available drug delivering contact lens. So 1961-62, fast forward through to 2022 before it becomes a commercial reality. 80 years, right? Yeah. 60 years. 60 years. 60 years. 60 years. So 60, years. 60 years to make a dream come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And now what we're seeing, and, and, and if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because if you can have a depot of a drug in a contact lens, as that, as that drug is leached from the contact lens, some of it's going to go onto the front surface of the lens, but a chunk of it's going to go into the back surface of the lens and it's going to be held against the cornea and the conjunctiva in that very, very small amount of tear film. And it's going to become concentrated and therefore you can afford to have a lower concentration of drug, making it cheaper. Mm -hmm. And also, more importantly, an increased residence time. So it, yeah. it's a great idea, but the, the, the difficulty is making a contact lens that delivers the, the drug over an extended period of time. Right. We, we, we published probably 40 papers or so looking mm. at using contact lenses as, as ocular drug delivery devices. And it's continually the same problem. You get this kind of burst release effect. So you put the lens in your eye, drug gets released too quickly. And you've got the same problem you get with a drop to, to a lesser extent. But that's been the challenge is how can we maximize the uptake of the drug into the into the lens, but then more importantly, control that release. And JNJ have, have finally been able to do that. And that's where we see this uh, this first commercial keto right. delivery lens. Right. Now, have you actually used that, Dave? Have you got any experience? Uh, you know, I, I haven't used it at all wow. on on anybody. We we. I think allergy season is a little bit different everywhere, but we kind of yep. went through it. And I think uh, probably guilty like most people is we just forgot about it and and didn't really think about it because when the when the when it was launched. But I uh, I, I I I think as we're we're heading into another round of allergy season, it's something that more and more people are going to have to start thinking about. So thank you for the reminder. Well, and I think it's only just received FDA approval as well, so yeah. I, I, I yep. know that it's going to be rolled out slowly, but. We, we've yeah. had it commercially available now in Canada for, for over a year. Um, Japan is the other is the other market that it's been approved in. Um, and then I've just come back actually from a meeting with a, a number of practitioners out west in Canada who've had the opportunity to use the lens and, and have certainly been very pleased with the results that they're having. So, mm -hmm. so that, those mm -hmm. those are two of the things that I think you know we we've had on the market now, which are futuristic, but they're here now. The other right. things that, that that people are working on again, obviously for the future. Myopia control. Myopia control is a huge, huge deal. Obviously, now we, we've got a number of products on the market, both contact lens and spectacles, as well as pharmaceutical agents that uh, that work very well. So we, we do have now proven products that work, and, and certainly some of those are contact lenses. We're going to see an expansion of those contact lens-related systems for myopia management for sure. Um, so that's going to be coming in a relatively short period of time. The other Are thing, you able to speak to what uh, what what types of problems we're going to be solving with the innovations? I realize there's probably some things you can't say yet, but uh, are there um, are there problems that we have now that we're going to be better solved uh, or something new? Or I, well, I think I think what's so we, we've got 
obviously from a number of studies now, the longest, of course, being the uh, acute revision MySight study that yeah. ended up being a brilliant study. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, seven years. So, you know, we were very fortunate. We were the, uh, we were the, we were the largest group that actually uh, were involved mm-hmm. in that. So of the, of the four sites, we had the most patients. And there's no doubt about the fact that um, soft lenses and rigid ortho K overnight um, lenses definitely work. The downside is that we, we still have a number of patients, of course, who are non-responders. And there's certainly an interest in looking at combo effect. So how can you take a contact lens and maybe combine that with, uh, with low-dose atropine? So there's some interest in, in looking at that. But when it comes to specifically the contact lens, I think what we're going to see is we're going to start to see some data coming out as to individualizing those lens designs. We know that there are some patients who, who simply don't respond, and we think that's probably because the, the optical design for that particular ocular system is not optimized. And there's a lot of work going into personalized medicine generally. You know, that's, that's not just in the contact lens field, that's generally. So I think we're going to start to see some diagnostic devices being produced, which will better enable us to come up with an optical design that works for those patients. So trying to look at individual profiles will work. That There is some really interesting work going on looking at trying to 3D print contact lenses in practice. So I can certainly see in, in this area having diagnostic devices that you scan your kids and, and you know it could be the same for multifocal lenses as well. You come up with an optimized optical design that then gets dumped down to a 3D bioprinter that you have in your office, which will individually print a lens. And, and, and again, we have some, some really interesting work going on with that. We've got a couple of grad students and some postdocs looking at, um, at 3D printing contact lenses. And again, sounds really science fiction, but you know, when I graduated in 85, if someone had said to me, oh yeah, within the next 10 years, you know, we're going to have a daily disposable contact lens. I would have said they were mad, like not a chance. The cost of lenses, holy heck, you had not a chance. So, you know, the, these futuristic things really do happen. So I think that's, that's we're going to see some really interesting myopia management stuff. Yeah. And then some, some more futuristic stuff, I think we're going to be looking at in contact lenses um, are, are really in two areas. The first of those is in not just drug delivery. There, there are going to certainly be more drug delivery devices coming out. Uh, so JNJ have, have one out now, and then there's a lot of other work going on looking at various other medications. But the use of contact lenses as diagnostics for disease, both ocular disease and systemic disease, are certainly a big area of focus for, for many research groups, both, both companies um, as well as individual research groups. And you're looking at companies here who are not just in the eye space. You know, you're looking at Google, you're looking at um, a a variety of other, particularly Asian countries, um, uh, looking at uh, Apple, all looking at these sort of diagnostic devices. Now, there is already one on the market, maybe some of the listeners actually don't know, but there already is a diagnostic contact lens that's an electronic contact lens that is actually used in the screening of patients with glaucoma. So this mm-hmm. is a lens uh, made by a company called Sensimed. It's called the Sensimed Triggerfish. It's produced by a Swiss company. And it has built into it an inbuilt strain gauge. And what that strain gauge does is it indirectly measures the pressure in your eye. It's a silicone-based lens, so a silicone elastomer, not a silicone hydrogel, but a silicone elastomer. And basically, as your pressure increases, so it has an impact on the strain gauge, it basically collects information on the lens It then has a battery and an infrared system, uh, a wireless system that offloads that information to a recorder that the patient wears around their neck. And you basically can record the interocular pressure over a 24 hour cycle. That's very helpful because, of course, it's very difficult to measure interocular pressure when a patient's asleep, their eyes are closed, and of course, they're lying down. So it's been available now for almost 10 years, actually. So that Mm technology has been around for a while. But other people are now looking at developing diagnostic contact lenses. We're looking at things like glucose in your tearful, and um, that's been around for, for quite some time. Novartis had a, an agreement um, with, uh, with with Google to look at that and, and actually abandon that project, but use some of the learnings for some other things. Um, we're looking at um, developing markers for the cancer in the tearful, mm-hmm. uh, looking at markers for things like Alzheimer's, as well as other systemic diseases as well. So people are really interested in using contact lenses 
and detecting information from the ocular surface or from the tear film to diagnose, say, not just ocular, but also systemic disease. Now, the really you know, interesting I, thing... Sorry, Dave. I, well, I, I think that, you know, that those things have been proposed and we've heard about some of these electronics, but um, it's it, it's just interesting how all of the devices in our lives have improved with Bluetooth and radio frequency and battery size and all of those sort of things. And so, you know, some of those sort of things have just waited until that next device for external communication has been available, right? And how the trigger fish has evolved and even gotten even better because of some of that external technology that needed to be developed. You know, the contact lens is there and ready to sit and do what it needs to do, but it's needed to house all that stuff. And and uh, now I think those those type of innovations have just uh, made strides and are continued to going to make strides because all that stuff is going to be better three years from now than it is today. Yeah. You know, leaps and bounds is going to double or triple in its innovation. Yeah, so, yeah you're, you're bang on. And you can see that actually in publications. It's really interesting if you track the kind of electronic contact lenses and drug delivery contact lens the publications. It basically triples about every five years. Mm-hmm. So the as those developments have occurred, so the the research in those areas have, have correspondingly increased in terms of interest because the likelihood of actually being able to commercialize something, of course, goes up enormously. Um, so combining those two things together, using a contact lens as a drug delivery device, and combining it with a diagnostic device, of course, is in that whole realm of theranostics. Theranostics being you know devices that are able to to both detect disease and then treat it at the same time. And so we're, we're looking at a new area of work, particularly actually being looked at in Asia, of developing what we call theranostic lenses, which are able to, say, take, take a disease, detect that disease, and then have an inbuilt reservoir of drug that on demand can deliver that drug at the same time, in the same way that we're seeing that now in, in diabetes. So theranostic contact lenses are being worked on. And, and I think if we're looking at that sort of diagnostic concept, we're probably five to 10 years before we're going to see really much come to market on that. And then the final thing is the thing that, you know, again, is, is really of interest because we're now seeing, in, you know, Apple, for example, saying that they're going to have a head up display contact lens within the next five years. Looking at companies like Mojo, really getting good attention in terms of their uh, you know, bringing in lots of money to have these, these head up display electronic type contact lenses. They've now formed a partnership with Menicom to uh, to look at trying to take these into to clinical trials. So, can you can you describe a little bit of what this? I, I think I understand what you're talking about, but some of the listeners may not. What what would this head up display type of thing look like? You put these contact lenses, and then you're in a virtual reality, or are you thinking exactly. more of an AI type of atmosphere? It's more like, it's more like augmented reality. So, so virtual mm-hmm. reality is where you're in a completely immersive. Yeah. Um, world with and that of course that's how we see these sort of these 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 uh, goggle type systems yeah the big headsets yeah the, the, the big headset ones augmented reality is where you basically overlay that information into the natural world and it, and it's really that augmented reality that we're looking at with contact lenses because the, the lens will be a, a a normal corrective device but it will have built into it basically screen ability such that you can actually have uh, have overlaid on your natural world either messages or websites or, or um, things, you know, people are looking at, for example, being able to uh, look at, uh, at um, facial um, recognition software so that you can, I mean, I'm terrible. It's like, ter- I'm really good at faces, but I'm terrible with names. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, one of the, the, the patents that have just come out from Asia is being able to look at someone's face and it automatically being able to tell you what the person's name is. How scary is that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so well, I think about the optometry conference that we go to and we don't have badges anymore. We just like see each other's names and, you know, you know, walking around the street and a stranger would be like, hey, what's up, Tim? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how cool is that? And of course, you know, the annoying thing about those badges is even when you do have badges, there's at least a 90 percent chance that the badge is going to be flipped around and you're looking at the back. <laughs> it's not 50 50. It's definitely 90 percent. Uh-huh. <laughs> those badges should be on both sides. But yeah, yeah, so there's but, lots of stuff going on in, you know, super duper, really exciting things about contact lenses. Yeah. And, and, and apart from that, you know, companies are really working on trying to, to solve the one major problem that we still continue to have, of course, which is comfort. You know, comfort or rather mm-hmm. discomfort is, is still a big issue. But we're looking at a lot of companies now trying to, to develop better 
materials that look more and more and more like the ocular surface. So more and more like the cornea or the conjunctiva, and such that when the undersurface of that lid, when that palpebral conjunctiva rubs over the lens, it feels more like it's rubbing over the cornea and the conj rather than a piece of plastic. So mm -hmm. those are you know, the, the kind of more basic things that companies are working on to, to try and make more biomimetic type lenses. So yeah. I think if you're, you know, if you're a contact lens practitioner, it's a really cool time it to, is. Be, uh, to be looking at using contacts in your practice. It is. I've been speaking for the last 10 years on new and innovative uses for contact lenses. And I'm, I, I still have the same course, but it's changed every year. And it's all these new things that are, you know, coming out, these new innovations, new ways we're using old technology. And, and uh, so uh, thanks for updating my lecture for me with the present <laughs> for the discussion today. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks a lot for uh, for all the things that you do for our industry, for contact lens practitioners. Uh, we really appreciate you and Debbie's uh, contribution. Uh, it's been it's been awesome. We we really appreciate everything you do. Yes, Dave. Great to great to have a chance to talk about it. Thanks. For yes. Meeting. Thank you. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next time on The OI Show.